Good morning to everyone, and thank you, Winter, for this kind introduction. I hope you had a lovely evening yesterday and a good dinner, and that you could at least see some of the beauty of Strasbourg. And if you didn't yesterday, and hopefully do it this evening. Um, we have a saying in Iceland which is, er fáment en góðment. It means it's a small crowd, but it's a good crowd. Um, and we might actually be even a great crowd. Um, but what I'd like to ask you to do um, for my presentation, I'm not going to give you any figures or I'm not trying to stuff your heads with information. I'm just going to show you some pictures while I speak. And I think of it more as a kind of a space of reflection rather than us being uh, informed about a great many things. The title of my talk is Crossing with Borders, Migrants and Human Rights in Today's Europe. And just like we were talking about briefly yesterday, it's very interesting the way in which children's rights can be apolitical and universal and women's rights even, uh, at least in some of our countries. But when it comes to migrants' rights, the human rights of migrants, suddenly it's a political issue, a fiercely political issue, so much a very delicate, very sensitive, as if, as if people who migrate across borders do not have the same human rights and the same uh, need and right for respect and dignity as the rest of us. So one of our, um, one of our tasks here this morning is to forget about all the politics and just focus on the individual. Uh, try to put ourselves in the shoes of the individual because that's what human rights is about. It's about individual consideration and about every single individual having the right to integrity and to human dignity as our fellow being in this planet. So I'd like to start with the conditions of detention in some places in Europe. And I'm going to read you a quote from one of the reports of the CPT, which is a, a body that was mentioned here yesterday, a body of the Council of Europe, which periodically goes and visits places of detention across Europe, writes reports and recommendations on what authorities should do. So this is from a report from Greece. Police and border guard stations continue to hold ever greater number of irregular migrants in even worse conditions. For example, at Sufli police and border guard station, members of the delegation had to walk over persons lying on the floor to access the detention facility. There were 146 irregular migrants crammed into a room of 110 square meters with no access to outdoor exercise or any other possibility to move around, and with only one functioning toilet and shower at their disposal. 65 of them had been held in these deplorable conditions for longer than four weeks, and a number for longer than four months. They were not even permitted to change their clothes. At times, women were placed in the detention facility together with the men. In the purpose-built Velakio Special Holding Facility for Foreigners, irregular migrants, including juveniles and families with young children, were kept locked up for weeks and months in filthy, overcrowded and unhygienic cage-like conditions with no daily access to outdoor exercise. Now, obviously, not all detention centers in Europe are this horrific, but some are. Being crowded and overcrowded as we speak. And this is, of course, a sign of a more general trend that is taking place across Europe, which is the criminalization of migration. And time and again, the Council of Europe, the Human Rights Commissioners and others, Parliamentary Assembly, the building where you are now, has repeatedly um, emphasized the fact that crossing borders, even without legal documents, even without 
uh, their the permission to stay is not a crime and there is no victim. But even given that, the fact is that in detention and even in outside in society, um, detainees who are there because they crossed borders are less protected, have often worse conditions, and worse access to information and to all the things that they should have access to than those who are protected under criminal law. Um, but one interesting thing um, that comes across in whatever the conditions of detention are, even the worst, filthiest, horrible conditions where people have to eat on the floor and sleep on the floor where the toilet is overflowing, or where they have, let's say, a golden cage, and a golden cage is still a golden cage. What comes out repeatedly from across Europe, it's the, the torture, really, of not knowing of having, feeling like you have no information. You don't understand why you're there, what you did wrong, what the process that awaits you is, what is gonna happen to you, where you're gonna end up. And all these things that we continue asking ourselves uh, when we find ourselves in a complete limbo, because at least when you're sentenced uh, as a criminal, you know, okay, I'll get out this day or you know, there is a procedure, I have a lawyer, etc. But you, you, you know your bearings in the world. But often, obviously, when you're a migrant, you don't even speak the language, you don't understand what's being said to you. Um, and if the authorities don't take care to make sure that there is an interpreter, that you have access to the outer world, etc., then, well, with a little bit of empathy, we can understand where people actually are. Now, obviously, before you wait and before you enter the waiting rooms of Europe, again, by the day and by the week, as we sit here, um, the largest uh, or the fastest growing graveyard of Europe continues to get bigger because migrants are taking ever more dangerous routes um, in the face of ever stricter immigration controls <coughs> to try to escape their misery and um, come to, to try to build a, a new life. And many of them are dying. We, we obviously knew and heard about Lampedu, the Lampedusa tragedy um, late last year, but there are many of these tragedies and many of them we don't really hear about. Um, one of the things that the Council of Europe has uh, put a lot of effort in and is still trying to put a lot of effort in and this is reflected not only by the Parliamentary Assembly but the, the, the European Court on Human Rights and various other monitoring mechanisms is to try to prevent what we call collective pushbacks where exactly what happens is that there is absolutely no individual consideration of the need of in, in, its individual of why they're escaping their, their home, home country, why they're moving away, but they're collectively being pushed back from the borders without being identified, without having access to asylum procedures. Uh, they're being pushed back by the authorities. Uh, and this is a, a growing concern, really, uh, in certain areas of Europe and a clear breach of international law because every single person has the right to, to claim asylum uh, and have their personal history and their personal testimony and their personal situation uh, considered because it's against international law to send a person back to a place where she is at risk of being persecuted or is at risk of, of torture or ill treatment or death. Now, but if you do make it, if you do make it to the promised land, then where actually are you? And this, of course, differs uh, according to different countries in Europe, and you know, its place has its own different uh, law, its own different services, etc. Um, but one thing is clear: uh, if you're an irregular migrant, meaning that if you don't have the, the legal permission to stay, 
you're really in a very, very vulnerable spot. And most irregular migrants actually uh, do not cross illegally, but outstay their stay. They came into the country legally, but then they're outstaying their permission. And what are some of the things that we, we find if you're an irregular migrant? Well, your children, even if children are supposed to be the most and most clearly protected of all, they probably are more likely not to have access to health care, any health care. Doctors uh, across Doctors Without Borders just recently published some statistics saying that 70% on average of children of regular migrants were not vaccinated against the most basic uh, diseases that we have fought for decades, such as measles. What about pregnant women, which is another category that is we, we, we pretend and tell ourselves that we are going to take extra good care of. Well, according to Doctors Without Borders, again, 66% of these women had no access to prenatal care. And let us also not kid ourselves. This has nothing to do with a country being rich or a country being poor. Because what is actually one of the most difficult places for an irregular migrant to be in terms of accessing social services or healthcare or basic healthcare for your child or when you're pregnant? Well, it's Sweden. Sweden, which some of us actually grew up thinking about as the promised land of equity and of human dignity. Obviously, Sweden does some other things really well when it comes to asylum seekers, etc. But the point is this, it's not about us being rich or poor. It's about the way we design uh, our society around the, those who have papers and those who actually don't. Now, again, despite all the failings and the weaknesses that we have in our protection, protection systems when it comes to children, they're still much more protected, even when they're not, or, or weakly, they're still more protected than those who turn 18. This particular girl is from Syria, her name is Ashra, um, and had to endure obviously a lot of terrible things, like millions of children are enduring as we speak because they're fleeing Syria and the, the horrors that they're facing there. <coughs> One thing that really hurt Asra is that her school was bombed and she was just about to take her final exam, her diploma, her dream of getting a diploma. And the reason I raise this is what we need to think and ask ourselves is that when unaccompanied minors come to our countries, maybe fleeing uh, Afghanistan, their parents have been murdered, they come alone, they're totally alone in a different country, under the age of 18, and they get some support because they're children. And perhaps they get to even start to learn the language, they start to learn a trade or get a, a work to work towards a diploma, but then the day they turn 18, in a lot of our countries, the day they turn 18, even if they're just about to finish, even if they need three months or four months or six months to finish their diploma and, and the, the rebuilding of their lives, we cut it and we say, now you're 18, now you're grown up, they cannot finish their studies anymore and they, all the protections that they have, weak as they may be, are gone overnight. And one interesting thing, there was just a recent um, study actually produced by the Council of Europe Youth Department and the UNHCR. And again, one of the themes that comes out from these young people is lack of information. Why aren't we told more about this 18-year-old birthday of ours? That most of the people we know around us in the countries we are trying to adopt as our own, look forward to, but overnight, we have nothing. And they don't even, some in, in, in certain places, have the right to, to contact their social worker anymore, which may be the person that they rely on. Um, and so what we need to ask ourselves, yes, her school was bombed in Syria, her diploma was ended, but what are we doing in our countries? We might not be bombing the schools, but what kind of a, 
uh, a shock are we putting into the lives of these young, uh, young people who are trying to build a new life on their own. And this is really perhaps the heart of my talk here, because when we speak about crossing borders in today's Europe, perhaps the most crucial question we need to ask ourselves is what moral borders are we ourselves, who are citizens of Europe, actually prepared to cross? Is it acceptable to us? Is it acceptable to us as citizens of Europe, um, where we often pride ourselves of the human rights um, mechanisms that we have put in place, and rightly so, as was also briefly discussed yesterday. But are we prepared to cross these borders of ethics and of human dignity that we are actually crossing now every day in the ways in which our societies exclude certain people from the basic human rights that they should be entitled to. And mind you, even obviously the irregular migrants um, are in the most vulnerable place and they're in the darkest place because they're in the shadows and they're very easily um, uh, open for exploitations of all kinds of sorts. But research shows that even people who have so-called um, better status, such as asylum seekers, who are entitled to more, um, legally entitled to more services, even refugees who in many countries have legal status and should be able to, for example, access healthcare. Research shows that there are all kinds of other barriers, even if they have the legal entitlement, there are administrative barriers that people just don't understand. There are language barriers, there are cultural barriers, there are financial barriers. There are all kinds of um, barriers that we build invisibly that people have a very hard time actually making good on whatever rights they may have in a legal sense. Now, we still have to obviously also focus on everything that's done well because there are uh, certain good practices um, happening also across Europe where people are trying to, to help migrants with accessing uh, healthcare, help um, build kind of knowledge and information and empowerment of migrants, but that always entails also um, a change of self. Even if you take something like a health, health, health service, if you want to be accessible to migrants, you also need to understand their needs. You, it, it needs to be obvious that they need interpretation, that they need different kinds of things that they, that the uh, other sorts of, of, of groups do, do not need. Um, and part of the information to all of us is obviously also dispelling myths such as the myths that migrants are burdening our welfare system. And all research, at least that we have had access to, to here, shows that they're not. They're contributing much more economically and actually not accessing the healthcare service, actually even in the way that they should be doing. And that might be good for all of us. Um, towards closing, obviously the Council of Europe is trying to do a, a great many things to try to address these issues. Um, and try to, again, remind all of us that we are speaking about human rights. Um, whatever our political um, inclination or, or political views of migration and immigration, there is obviously the Court of Human Rights, which we spoke about yesterday. There is the Parliamentary Assembly, which has, um, has a lot of reports, excellent work, actually, resolutions on, on different aspects of migration. There's the Commission of Human Rights who periodically also visits countries and, and brings out recommendations. And there is actually one of my favorite instruments, which is not well known, but should be more well known, which is the European Social Charter, which 43 countries of Europe have signed on to, but domestically needs to be um, put more into to practice to actually preserve the rights 
of everyone within the state's territory. Now, we all know, and this was touched upon also yesterday, that institutions often fail. Recommendations, resolutions, well, they're great on paper, but in practice, they often fail. And another thing that comes out when you actually speak to migrants, when you speak to migrant children, when you speak to migrant youth, migrant pregnant women, what well, comes out? Well, it's actually that one person who makes all the difference, the one person who showed them kindness, who understood their situation, uh, who, who even might not have changed anything in their, actually, in their legal situation or in the fact that they were being deported or whatever, but showed empathy. And I wanted to, to end on this note because, again, here also we have examples of good practice. I name, for example, in Austria, uh, which would by no account be the model country for, for migrants, but has good practices as well, such so as um, that families, Austrian families, are starting to try to promote an Austrian family to adopt an unaccompanied mig migrant, not in the legal sense, but to be a, a, a family of support for an unaccompanied migrant and the unaccompanied migrants um, uh, minors who have been interviewed say that this has made a huge difference to them. Even just seeing them once every month, coming to a family, to a home, get, knowing someone in, your, in the community in which you're placed makes a tremendous difference um, psychologically and socially. Um, so I think I'll close on that note because every single one of us can actually uh, try to be that one person in one sense or another. It doesn't take all that much in the end. Thank you very much.